Hi, hi, Leila. Hi, again. Hi. I see My you also had a haircut. I did. I did. It's legal <laughs> <love> now. <laughs> so today, my guest is Filippo Gorini, who made his, was it your Canadian debut? Yes. It was. For yes. us on February, in last February 2019 where he played the most incredible concert, which, forgive me, Filippo, I will describe as a Beethoven burger, because not even a Beethoven sandwich, because the burger is more substantial. He played Beethoven Opus 110, followed by Bartok Sonata, followed by uh, Stockhausen, and then Beethoven Opus 111, and it was a most extraordinary experience. So. Here's what Philippe, I, we want to know what Filippo has been up to, but I want to tell you, uh, I read a little bit about, about him this morning from his website. Now, I urge everybody to go to his website when you've heard what Filippo has to say. But one of the things that he's currently busy with is, and I'm quoting from his website, Nothing makes me as passionate as delving into a deep work of music, taking a long time to make sense of it, and then sharing what I've achieved with an audience. This is the heart of making music for me as a performer. And when I received news of the Borletti Butoni Trust Award, I knew I could use their support to finally bring to the world a project on Bach's The Art of Fugue, a work I deeply love and had already been studying since 2013, when you must have been about five, right? <laughs> anyway, <No>. Filippo, <laughs> Filippo, let's, um, before we even talk about what you've been doing and so on, Let's explain what the Borletti Buitoni Trust is and how this has enabled to you to take this journey. So the Borletti Buitoni Trust is a foundation in, in, instituted in London by Ilaria Borletti Buitoni and Franco Buitoni, her husband. And it's a charitable, charitable uh, trust that gives sponsorships and awards and fellowships to young musicians to promote uh, artistic projects that they couldn't realize otherwise. This year, I was very lucky to, to be chosen for the Borletti Trust uh, Award, which is a 30,000 uh, pound budget. And with it, I can try and, and do something interesting and hopefully profound for, for people to, to enjoy. And so at what point, Filippo, do you, um, do you have to tell them what it is you're going to do does that come up before you give them the award or is that all part of what the decision is it is you are asked to submit ideas that you have uh, to give a, an impression of what you might like to to achieve with uh, with the sponsorship and they do yeah. base a decision on this as well it's not um, a fixed agreement. So once you are given the award, you can discuss with the Borletti Buitoni Trust team your ideas and your projects, and you can change your mind. Uh, but they want to see that you're making good use of of the award. That is the only thing. But they are very reasonable and flexible, and actually the most uh, supportive team to be working with. So I'm enjoying the collaboration a lot. That's wonderful. So now tell us how you embarked upon this. And in fact, would you dare to say that this um, COVID isolation time has in fact helped you to progress better with this project? One of the projects that I suggested immediately, but I didn't have a clear plan yet of what I wanted to do, but it was to do a project around the Art of Fugue. Uh, the Art of Fugue by Bach is an, an incredible masterpiece. And I first learned about it when I was, I think, 11 or 12. And it was one of the most incredible examples of, of fugue writing that were shown to me to illustrate what, what a fugue is, what counterpoint is when I was studying as a, as a child, basically. And 
while studying piano here in Italy, we all have to take two years of harpsichord. And during those two years of harpsichord, I started, uh, I, I, I played two of these counterpoints uh, by suggestion of uh, the, uh, Sergio Vartolo, who's a very uh, fantastic harpsichord player here from Italy, who did um, uh, a lot of work on the art of fugue that uh, is still very important musicologically wise as well. And I was terrible at the harpsichord. It was my worst mark in, in the conservatory and definitely not my instrument, but I did fall completely in love with the, with the piece uh, and with the, how, how, how deep the intensity of expression uh, it can reach and uh, how all of this structure and the towering uh, intellectual architecture are all in service of, of achieving a deep commotion to the listener and the player. And I read a bit about the, the story of the piece more in detail, and there are so many secrets and puzzles and, and mysteries, and everything about this work is fascinating. Uh, you can look at it from any perspective, whether it is the compositional technique, the history, the symbols, the esoterical um, uh, themes that were uh, in Bach's mind and in that period, in the last period of his life, the unfinished last few, which poses a question to all performance, what to do about it. Should we complete it? Should we ask someone else to complete it? Should we just stop or maybe not play the fugue entirely? So everything about this work was interesting. And so while doing of course, many other things. I did my the Beethoven competition, my recitals. I was always in the background studying slowly the, these counterpoints, which are, uh, for, for especially for, for the mind, uh, a, a big challenge to learn. And it's a very slow process. So when uh, I received this news of the Borletti Boitoni Trust, I, I, I thought maybe, you know, since this is a work that sometimes is feared and considered hard or complex for, for audiences. And uh, some people even think it should not be played in, in concerts. I thought maybe uh, if I can build a project around it, uh, people can understand it more, fall in love with it the same way that I did, and possibly, uh, you know, enjoy it as it should be and, and not uh, as just a purely theoretical uh, legendary uh, piece that, that people don't actually listen to so often. Okay, so now let's take these baby steps. Let's, let's start right at the beginning. How did the ideas formulate? And obviously one idea led to another idea to another idea. So what is your journey with this so far? So the heart of the project is recital performances with the art of fugue. Uh, this to me is always the most important thing. It, it is the, the one way that is most complete to enjoy a piece with a, a live performance uh, where a musician enters in contact with the audience and, and delivers the piece in front of them. How long and is the piece, Filippo? It depends who plays it. Uh, I play it in about 92 minutes. Right. Okay. It is 14 counterpoints and four canons. And uh, it, it is a long stretch, but it it's very much worth it. <laughs> so this is the, 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 the center. And I, I thought, what next? And something that I've been told, I, apparently I'm uh, good at enough, is uh, talking to audiences about music. Uh, I've done it a lot in the past years. Basically, as soon as I started having a concert career, I also had chances to speak to young students from elementary age to university and to audiences and talk to them about the, the music that I play. And what I try to focus on, besides uh, some details about the history and helping to listen to the piece but what i try always try to focus on is why is this piece 
why does it matter so much to me? Because I find that the empathy with, with which people can listen to music when they understand why this music means so much to me that I spend hours every day at the piano learning it and then my time traveling to go and play it uh, as, uh, everywhere as much as I, as I can. And, and when you start talking to them about how you fell in love with a piece, how it works and why is it so impressive to you, they react in, in, a, in a very sincere and natural way. You clearly love talking to audiences. Now, the first thing that I think is notable about you is the fact that you are so Italian and you are so young and your English is so perfect. So could you please explain why your English is so perfect for starters? Well, I, I, I did spend about a year and a half in England near Oxford when I was a, a child because of my parents' work uh, as physicists. And I attended English school and that did the trick, I would say. I, I did How learn in, I was nine, 10. Mm -hmm. You know, so the you age where you really a absorb a language. Exactly, exactly. And then, you know, I, I tried to, to just maintain it. And of course, since I started a more international career, I, I, I most of the work-related discussions and emails and everything is, is mostly in English. Okay, so that was the first question I wanted to ask you. Then you said, so, okay, you talk to audiences about the music you're going to play. And I think the, the impression you make on me when you tell me that story is, you know, I think of pianists like, say, Marie Pariah, who, when I attend a concert of Marie Pariah, and I, I feel that with you too, when I've heard you, and there, there are pianists where the, what, they're, what you're playing you have absorbed and you've studied and studied. And when you sit there on the stage and you let this music come forth, it's what the, what the audience hears is what's been on the score and you're not sitting in the way. I am hearing Beethoven's writing or Bach's writing is coming straight into my ear. There isn't an intermediary. And I think that's the ultimate truthful extraordinary way of convincing an audience that what you're doing is wonderful, right? Is it? Well, I, I don't know how to respond. That is a, a huge compliment. Thank you. <laughs> well, it, 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 it is what, what I try to do. I, I, I hope it is what most uh, pianists try to do. Uh, we have a, a text in front of us, a score that contains an incredible amount of information and especially with certain composers like Beethoven, it is very, very detailed. Of course, I am sure that uh, without my intention, big traits of my personality will come out in my playing. Uh, but I think what I hope people can hear is uh, some sincerity in, in trying to just be a servant to the composer. So here, Philippa, when you were talking about in the score and adhering to the score and what the composer intended, I wonder if in any possible way one could perhaps put that onto a playwright and an actor interpreting what the playwright has written. I actually make this comparison a lot when I'm asked uh, what does it mean to interpret a piece of music? You know, sometimes people who are not accustomed with classical music that I know will ask me, but you always play pieces that are, were written 200 years ago. Uh, what is it that, that, that you do? Why is it so important? And it is exactly like reading a poem or reciting a, a play. Uh, it needs to be continuously brought back to life by uh, contemporary artists. And even though you have a score, you have the words in a poem or uh, the script in a play, 
you have the score in, in, in music, there is still an infinite amount of liberty uh, within which you can act without being unfaithful to the composer. And that is the margin in which great interpretations lie. So let's just go back to Art of the Few. Um, so for the people who are listening to this, some, some are really knowledgeable about music, some maybe aren't so knowledgeable, and you talked about canons and fugues. Now, one has to assume the canons that you're talking about are not the kind that dislodge uh, firepower. Could you tell <laughs> the people who are listening what a canon is? A canon is a form of music in which the, there are two or more voices that perfectly follow each other playing the same notes, basically. So the classic example that everyone knows is uh, Frère Jacques, you know, Frère yeah. Jacques, Frère, which you can sing and you can start with one voice and then someone else joins in a bit later and they you know, continue to form a composition where everyone is playing the, the same thing or singing the same thing, just uh, with a shift in time. Right. right. And of course, that is a very simple example, but canon writing can reach extreme levels of complexity. And sometimes the, also a, a shift of pitch is applied. Or in one case, in the art of fugue, uh, you have one voice uh, which leads, and the second one enters in contrary motion and with double values of the notes. So it's, it's slower, exactly half the speed, and it, it's, uh, in contrary motion, so going downwards when the other was coming up. And to govern a, a canon the last five or six minutes uh, in this way, uh, so that it also sounds like very expressive music, this is a, a task that few composers and mainly just Bach have, have achieved that level. And all the canons in the art of fugue are with only two parts, so two voices. And they are all incredibly beautiful. Uh, the fugues, instead, I, uh, maybe people are more accustomed with uh, fugues. Uh, it's a form of writing in counterpoint, so uh, with uh, three or four voices in, in the art of fugue. Sometimes there, there could be more uh, that are written, creating. Uh, harmony by moving each part against the other. So there is not accompaniment, and there is not uh, a single melody that is thematic. Every part has it, its own importance and melodic uh, validity, and they all move intersecting e each other. And in a fugue, there is a main subject, or sometimes more, that is the leading voice, which you will hear being exposed in one of the voices and then coming to each other and coming and occurring again throughout the whole composition. So, I mean, one associates Bach is the, the pinnacle of the fugue. I don't, I've never thought about this before, but when, who wrote the first fugue? Where does the fugue come from? And do you know where, <laughs> have I stumped you? Oh. You have, definitely. No! Bravo, Lila! <laughs> um, you know, I've never thought about that before. Did Bach invent the fugue? No, no, he did not in invent the fugue. Uh, counterpoint came straight out of the, of the Middle Age and was, of course, the most uh, important way of composing music in the Renaissance. Right. And uh, Richard Cari and, uh, and Madrigals were all written with very strict counterpoint technique, as well as, uh, as masses and, and sacred compositions. Right. Uh, in a way, at the time of Bach, counterpoint was already considered like some obscure science of the past that was to be studied, but not really suitable for the modern taste of music. And uh, in Bach's will to, to stay on counterpoint, uh, there is actually uh, in, inside it already a, a belief that this kind of, of writing from, from the ancients is the, the way of writing that most elevates the spirit towards God. 
rather than the more fancy uh, way of, 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 of writing music that was becoming more common uh, in Europe at the time. Um, when exactly the first fugue was written, at this moment, I would not know. Your fascination with this music, I mean, the range of your interests is quite staggering to me because you, you invest so much into this incredible work of Bach, and you've obviously invested a lot of time and devotion to the music of Beethoven, and uh, and you play contemporary music as well. Do you go through phases, or do you keep you juggle all the balls in the air at the same time? And does that keep you relatively sane, or how do you manage your life with music? I'm not sure I have rules. Uh, basically, what I try to do is. Uh something Maurizio Pollini said, I only play pieces that I know I can spend a lifetime with uh, without, uh, you know, losing ability to, to learn from them and, and in, improve my, my playing of them. And this is also why I, I like studying now uh, works like the Hammerklavier Sonata or the Diabelli Variation or the, the Art of Fugue, because I know that 40 years from now when I'm, 64, something that's Beatles. Well, uh, when I'm 64, I will still be very happy to be practicing these these works and and improving them and changing my mind about them uh, as also the world around me changes. And besides that, I, 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 I like playing also contemporary music because well, my teacher, my main teacher, uh, Maria Grazia Bellocchio, She's a specialist in contemporary music. And uh, I had a chance to meet composers, to see how they work, to go to concerts with contemporary music since a very young age. And at first I was quite, quite shocked. I, I would say I, I didn't really understand this music at all. And you know, my attitude as I, I was, I think, 13 or 14 at the time was, uh, you know, my teacher, whom I know can play Beethoven and Chopin wonderfully, dedicated her life to this music. Either she is dumb or I am missing something. And since then, I, I tried learning more and more. And after a while, which is not actually that long, you get accustomed to the individual languages of composers throughout the last century and even contemporary composers working today. And it is actually often a, a much more interesting uh, listening experience than listening to you know, traditional repertoire over and, and over again. Uh, it requires to be open-minded and sometimes it requires to listen to very bad pieces because occasionally uh, you know, we listen to pieces that have not been filtered by history and sometimes they're objectively really bad. Yeah. But from working with composers and from seeing music being composed today, I think you, you get a much more contemporary look also at the scores of the past and an ability to see what has maintained uh, in, a, in a tradition, what has been changed. And, and also, you know, the difficulties composers face in practicalities, but also in finding inspiration and how they deal with them. And I think you understand much more about how Beethoven or, or, or Bach must have, uh, have felt and lived their life as, as composers and how their works came to be born by seeing how composers uh, do all of that today. Have you ever written anything yourself? I never really felt this urge to try and, 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 and write a, a piece of music. Uh, maybe it's strange, but it, it, I never felt it. I, I thought about, oh, maybe it would be interesting to try and write something, but the same way that you think maybe it could be interesting to write a poem once, try and see how it works or, 
And I, I am very content and passionate about studying and, and giving a voice to the works of, of others, both, both contemporary and past composers. Now, um, one of the things, and I, I don't know if you want to carry on talking about this incredible project that you've got going here, but one of the... Well, it's great <laughs> publicity. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, in, it's just remarkable what you've, you've come up with and all the aspects that you're going into because, you know, it's more than, it's more than music. It's more than the sum of its parts. Um, but you are also going to go for the first time to Marlborough this summer. And I guess that's postponed to the following summer, I would hope. Um, and you, you've been to Prussia Cove, and we're talking now suddenly about chamber music. Um, and do you enjoy playing chamber music? I do. I do very much, uh, especially if the right conditions are, are met. And by right conditions, I mean I like to rehearse. Um, to me, playing chamber music with with few rehearsal which is something that the the, the business today and the, the rhythm of concert life sometimes imposes it feels very artificial if i play a piece at the piano i don't practice for months left hand and right hand separately and then just put them together <laughs> the day before a concert that yeah. would be insane but this is basically what happens today with uh, concert, with uh, chamber music and also with concertos, which is something I don't like because at the end the risk is that you put you, you put nothing in communion with the other uh, the other musicians except maybe you know going in in time and playing the right notes with more or less the right feeling. But you can't you cannot build an a, an interpretation. Right. It has happened, and uh, in, in some cases, I, I've had to do it, and uh, I, I'm not particularly ashamed of it. And with very good musicians, sometimes you can achieve very good results even with one rehearsal, which is something in, in, incredible in itself. But I still think if we've had one week more, maybe instead of being just very good, this might have been great. So places like Prussia Cove or Marlboro are exactly the, the ideal occasion for me to play chamber music because there you, you live with musicians for a week or in the case of Marlboro yeah. for, for almost two months, for seven weeks, and you rehearse and talk and have dinner and go for walks and stay together. And maybe then something meaningful can, can really be, be born. Am I allowed to ask you how you are now proceeding with the art of fugue? I've learned, I finally finished learning the piece that I was studying uh, since, uh, as I said, since 2013. And I, I can play it now from memory, which is, uh, has, has been quite a challenge, uh, honestly. And I feel very clearly what my kind of interpretation will be like. Um, and that is a pianistic interpretation in, in which I do not try to just imitate the harpsichord or, or the organ, but I, I, I try to use the piano in all its, of its possibilities. Uh, a very expressive, I hope, interpretation, uh, because I think there are some counterpoints in. Uh, I, I think, for example, about counterpoint eight, eleven, and the last unfinished fugue, which uh, achieve moments of such intensity that I, 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 I am almost overwhelmed when when yeah. I play them, even out outside of concert, which is not yes. something that happens so so frequently. Yes, and, I understand and, that. And so this is the point that I'm at, and I I will record uh, a CD of it in in Berlin in September, which is one of the other uh, aspects of my project. And then with the the audio recording from the CD, we will also do uh, a film recording of, of the piece, 
uh, which I hope to do, it is not yet confirmed, but I hope to do in uh, uh, an astonishing contemporary art installation here in Milan, which is the Seven Heavenly Palaces by Anselm Kiefer. And the reason for that space, I, I thought very long where an ideal space to, to place this work could be. And uh, Kiefer's art revolves deeply around themes of spirituality, of ancient religions, of uh, symbols, of, of numbers, of uh, other alphabets, which is the, the kind of interest that in, in his last 10 years Bach cared a lot for. And besides that, so in the project there will be concerts, lecture recitals, a CD, a film. And the other thing I really wanted to do is uh, a podcast uh, with uh, conversations recorded in, in video with artists and, and thinkers of very different fields uh, that I think embody with their work thematics that are going to help when listening to the art of fugue. Uh, so this will be a podcast with uh, 15 episodes. The first episode I will do a, a, an introduction as I would do in, in a national lecture recital to the piece for, for listeners. And for the rest, there will be conversations with contemporary composers, but also uh, a painter, uh, an architect, uh, mathematician, uh, physicist. For example, you talk a lot about the sense of architecture and, and shape in music. And to us musicians, it is very clear in a, in a practical way why we speak about architecture in music. But I'm not sure it is so clear to an audience. And I think if I can talk to a, a very well-renowned architect. I cannot say the name yet, but if I can, you know, talk about the similarities between actual architecture and music making, and how Bach, uh, how an architect sees the music of Bach and how it has influenced his life and work, I think this conversation, first of all, is interesting to have for me, and possibly leaves a uh, embedded the idea that music and architecture have a lot to do. And also, uh, I will be talking to contemporary thinkers, uh, people alive and, and working today, and creating a dialogue between a, a piece of music of the past and uh, the times of today that is also, for me, very important. I, I do not care about making music if it's just like exhibiting something in a museum. Uh, it, it needs to become uh, alive for the audiences of today and 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 be born from from someone that that lives today as as I am and as all these people that I want to interview are. And also for example, uh, a mathematician who has worked all his life on group theory, which is uh, one of the most interesting branches of advanced mathematics today that deals with all the possible kinds of symmetries in as many dimensions as, as you can possibly conceive. Um, he, he will be able to give an idea of why symmetry is so appealing to humans and the different levels at which it can be studied. And in the art of view, there is a lot of symmetry. There is, to me, the, the most astonishing example of, of symmetry in music is, is in here. We have two counterpoints, uh, few, uh, the counterpoint number 12 and 13, which are completely invertible. So you can see the score and you see the, the four voices that make the counterpoint 12. And if you just flip them down, you see another counterpoint, which is completely working and just as beautiful and expressive as the other one. So that's also why I think it, it, it might be interesting to talk about this with a, with a mathematician who, who knows so much more about this than, than I do. Absolutely, oh my God. So just tell me one other thing. Let, can we come down 29 levels? And are you the only musician in your family? Are you the only person who plays an instrument in your family? 
I am the only professional musician, but yes, my father but... plays the piano. Uh, yes. He studied piano to quite an advanced level uh, when he was younger. And my older brother also plays uh, the piano. Uh, I mean, he's, he also studied piano since he was very young. And how uh, old so were music... you when you started? I was six. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And at what stage did you realize that this was going to be your career? There were steps to it. I, I first became personally invested in music when I was, I think, around 12. There was a, a moment where suddenly music became very important to me and I started listening to as much music as possible to sight read all of the scores I had at home. Uh, I, I started looking for a better teacher and so on. And, and maybe already dreaming about becoming a concert pianist someday. And then, you know, I, had, I found finally a, a teacher that I really felt uh, that I was in the right hands with. And I started, you know, practicing a lot more and having uh, harder exams and doing conservatory and and taking some small competitions and some small concerts in which I played and all you know usual being a music student life and I think I at that point I knew I wanted to be a pianist I didn't know if it was possible realistically if, if I would be, you know, good enough to 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 mean something to the world as a pianist and to make a living out of it. You know, when when I was on holiday, that was the, the most clear moment for me. When I was on holiday, and I had no uh, no things that I was forced to do, I could stay even a month without doing mathematics or physics, which were the other things that I really liked a lot. But I couldn't stay a week without playing the piano. And even if I stayed a couple of days, at the same time, I was thinking about music and what pieces I, I want to play and how I want to play them. Oh, I want to play this Schumann sonata, but I don't like the way this, I like prefer the Pauline interpretation or Kissin plays it really well and so on. And that moment I knew if I didn't do this for my life, I would be miserable for the whole life because I, I would just be regretting and, and, and thinking about this all the time and, and, and having to do something else. Filippo, so how much can you spend time studying a piece by just looking at the score and away from the keyboard? I, I don't tend to study the score itself for very long times outside of, of the keyboard. Um, of course, when you begin uh, studying a new piece, you try you know, to learn the, the notes, to read it correctly, and to make an analysis of it and read also analysis by, by other uh, composers or musicologists or other performers. But most of the time that I'm studying a piece and not at the keyboard, I am not studying the score, I think. Right. I'm either listening to interpretations or, or thinking about my own or re-listening to uh, maybe I record myself, you know, in, in, in practice and I try to listen to what I've done and, and why is it terrible. And, um, and, and also then you, you try to, to listen to, 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 to inform yourself about the, the history of the piece and the composer. I, I don't spend so much time just studying the score, not at the keyboard. I want to quote Joyce Di Donato, who said that she loves to perform in front of an audience, whether it's an opera or a song. She likes to perform in front of an audience that's never been exposed to that music before, because they come to it new and fresh. Otherwise, if they know the piece well and they've been to see the opera 50 times, they already walk into the hall with their three favorite performances of the work in their head. 
and then all they do is try to measure up the artist on stage. Do you see what I'm getting at? Oh, absolutely. This is uh, an actual problem, I think, that goes uh, as high up as, as, as even professional music critics. Um, what I think is if you listen to two or three different interpretations and keep listening to them and only them, then especially if you don't try to keep an open mind if, and if you don't know the score, then all you're going to look for in any new performance is what you already know from those three. If you listen to 50, well, now we are talking. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, if you listen I to fifty, I, either yeah. you, you start thinking that uh, half or more of of these pianists are just terrible and and charlatans or or, yeah. or whatever, or you come to accept, especially if you know the score, that yeah. each has taken decisions uh, based on their own personality, their the the age in which they lived, the, you know the, the years and where they came from and and what they knew at, at the time about the, the piece and the score and each leads to a very passionate and and sincere interpretation if, if it's a good one or sometimes you yeah. don't like it yeah and then uh, listening to a lot of of interpretations just opens up you know the gaze to a, a wide range of, of, of possibilities rather than closing it down of course, if instead you just listen to Michelangeli on, on the same piece and that is the way to play and nothing else is acceptable, then what is going to happen when you hear a, a young pianist playing the same work and he doesn't play like Michelangeli? He's, ah, he's not Michelangeli. Which is so, the kind of <laughs> snobbish attitude that I detest the, the most. It's funny, you know, I suppose this, as we come to the end of this, and it's been an incredible, for me anyway, um, opportunity to get to know you even more. Um, I just want to go to Michelangeli for a second. I was in uh, um, in Austria at the Feld Festival in Salzburg last July. And I walked past a store that was selling CDs and there was a big box of Michelangeli. You know, they put all together all the things he'd recorded. When I was a student at, at uh, university, Michel he actually came to South Africa to play. And I heard him in London. And he was my god. You know, his recording of uh, the Brahms Paganini variations. And I loved his Scarlatti and Galuppi. And, I, he was just, woo. So I bought the box. I came home with the box. I put the first CD on and I listened and I thought, did I really think that was so wonderful? It's just a very funny thing as one goes through life, how things change. Times change, our own tastes change. There are uh, periods in which we might feel closer to one performer uh, and periods in which we find it intolerable almost. And I think this is a, a wonderful thing. You know, it, it means that uh, during life, there is a variety of, of choices of interpretation and you will always be able to find the one that moves you the most in that particular moment. So, you're supposed to be coming back in the spring to play for us, and it's a mixed program. But what you've been talking about, you're going to have to come back again because you'll have to come and do the Bach here because you can't talk about it so passionately and then leave all these people with the VRS and Vancouver and all our followers not being able to have that experience. So um, you just got yourself another invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, I, uh, I have very fond memories of my concert in, in Vancouver and uh, my car trips with you and seeing a <laughs> bit of the city. Okay, and well, I'm re actually really looking forward to, to being back in, in the spring. And great. if the, the, the audience in Vancouver will be happy to listen to my Bach, then great. I am ready to come. 
They, they will, because you know what? They trust us and they will trust you. Merci, you, Filippo. Sleep well tonight. I will. Thank you for certainly. your time. Ciao. Thank you. It's been really wonderful.